Hi, Mike Kennedy. I want to discuss a subject that I find fascinating, and that's that some people have more than one set of DNA. Chimerism is what it's called. I'm only going to say it once, because every other time I say it, I make a mistake. Okay? But how can you have two sets of DNA? Okay. Well, our first uh, run-in with this was the phenomenon of a reabsorbed twin. Sometimes you can have twins, okay? A twin is when uh, uh, an identical twin we're going to talk about first is you have a fertilized egg and it separates and becomes two individuals, okay, identical twins. Now, what happens sometimes as they continue to grow, something happens to one of them, and it's it's reabsorbed into the other twin, okay? And that's called a reabsorbed twin. But the individual that's born actually has two sets of DNA. So, uh, if you look this up in some, especially in some older references, you'll actually see pictures of people that have strikingly lines on their body or patterns where this refusion uh, took place at a point where actually uh, uh, is obvious that there's uh, two different things going on, okay? Uh, and sometimes patterns on people's backs, on the skins and things like that. And so uh, people would look at that and say, oh yeah, this is the reabsorbed twin phenomenon. We can easily see it by looking at the, 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 this person's skin even, we can tell that there's been uh, uh, this reabsorbed twin function has happened. But they started looking further and they found out that a lot of times this was happening with absolutely no uh, uh, physical manifestations at all. I watched a show about this, it was fascinating, where uh, this woman was in court for fraud because she had like, I can't remember the exact number, but I'll say four children. She was collecting, she had a husband who had, was out of the scene and she was connect, collecting benefits from the state. Well, somehow the state had decided to do some DNA testing. And they found out, in fact, that those were not her children. They had taken a sample from her I assume either a blood test or a sample from her mouth and for DNA comparisons and they did with the children and there was not a match so they weren't her children so she was guilty of fraud. She was in court and they were going to take these children away from her and they were going to put her in jail. Well, uh, she had her ex come and her ex said, no, I was there when these children were born. These are the children that were born to my wife. I, I physically saw them uh, come out of my wife, my ex-wife. They are her children. And the court's kind of like, wait a second. You've heard something about this before, some confusion. Okay, and they studied it, looked into it further, and they found out that she did have two sets of DNA. She had the set uh, of DNA from where they tested her, whether it was a skin or a blood, but her actual eggs contain different DNA, so that uh, her children were not a genetic match for the cells, say, that they took from her cheek. And uh, then there was another case where a woman needed a some type of uh, transplant and so they did, took some testing from her and her children, and they were like, you know, usually it would be the man you'd approach and say, well, I'm sorry, but you're not the father. But they go to the mother and they say, I'm sorry, but you're not the mother. And she's like, no, of course I'm the mother. And they kind of knew it too, but they were kind of confused. Well, what they did, because she, she, uh, she had to have more extensive testing, they found that she, again, was a person that had uh, different sets of DNA in her. She had two sets of DNA. Now, 
something even more fascinating has come out in recent years. And I remember, I wish I could give the exact date on this, but I'm going to say at least 10 years ago. Okay, at least 10 years ago, I subscribed to Science News, which is a little kind of uh, a very condensed, uh, uh, I could almost call it a weekly reader for uh, uh, science discoveries, but of course for adults, but it was, you know, like X number of pages long and you get it each month and you'd read through and it'd be this kind of an abstract about something. And there was this one abstract saying, Jay, we've been looking at mice, female mice, and we're starting to find X chromosomes in their brain for no reason. And we're deducing since it only has happened with mice that had had sons, or, or other words, I'm saying sons, that's a human term, but have only had male offspring, that these, oh, sorry, Y chromosomes, that didn't make sense. Erase all that. Pretend I edited that out. I'm not going to bother to edit it out. Okay. They look in these mice, female mice brines, and they find Y chromosomes. And they're saying, what's up with this? And then, as they're looking at their research longer, they see that it's only the mice who have had uh, male offsprings. So they deduce correctly that there's an exchange going on, and these Y chromosomes in the the mother's brain are being transferred from the fetus into the female's brain. Okay, now they do. This is 10 years ago, they've done more research, and what they've really found is, now they have a term, which I'll try to pronounce again, microchimerism, that every human, they've proven this now with humans, every human mother has in her brain, for her entire life, well, from the the, when she actually had the child in her womb, whether the child is brought to term or not, she has that DNA inside of her brain for the rest of her life. Now, isn't that fascinating that such a thing would happen? That that a mother would actually carry the DNA of all of her children in her mind for the rest of her life. It's just a, just a, a fascinating thing to me. And uh, there's some research that shows or gives the impression that uh, it happens all the time, but it can also happen if the mother needs certain brain cells, needs more brain cells. You can call and that the fetus will send up more brain cells. Now, of course, the fetus is at the point where it can just multiply its brain. It's, it's building its brain cells. So uh, if it, uh, I can't. I can't even make up a number for this, but let's say it, it needs to donate a hundred brain cells to the mother to actually help do something for the mother. That's no problem because it's manufacturing more brain cells all the time. So there's some indication that sometimes it can actually be a, a benefit uh, for the mother in, in doing some type of uh, uh, repairing in the in the brain and other times it's just something that's done it's always done that some of those brain cells uh, you know they they travel through the uh, through the placenta and everything and they get to the mother's brain and they're deposited there and they're kept there they're kept there safe and they're kept there for the entire life of the adult human woman it's so just just amazing and again doesn't matter whether the child is brought to term or not. They're there, and they're there for the rest of the life of the woman. Isn't that fascinating? Very, very fascinating. When we talk about uh, science and we talk about the bonding between mother and child, and now we know there are certain hormones that uh, create bonding, but now we know that they actually carry in their minds, in their brains, the actual DNA of all of their born, all of the children that were in their wombs. Very, very interesting. Bye.
fascinating as caramelism. <laughs> Camerism. Camer, camer, 